Presented by Caltech. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see so many here interested in AI and science at the same time. Uh, from the last talk, I will shift focus a little bit back towards engineering. Um, I'm a postdoc uh, here at Caltech uh, in the uh, aerospace group. Uh, however, my background is in computer science, and I will be talking about robotics today. And you will see that in robotics, we have a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work, and so a lot of different people come together in the engineering sciences, including mechanical, electrical, uh, aerospace, and computer sciences. So for today, I have two things on my agenda. First, I want to talk a little bit about the lab and kind of introduce you to the kind of work we're doing and the things we're interested in. And secondly, I want to demonstrate one concrete recent research that we have done also in collaboration with Yisong to kind of show you how AI and machine learning specifically can help us uh, to advance the state of the art. All right. Our lab is called ARCL, which is the Aerospace Robotics and Controls Lab. And maybe the most uh, famous picture is this one, which is on our lab webpage. And that's actually not photoshopped, it's real. Uh, it is an experimental lab space where we can try uh, satellites uh, here on Earth. And so that's pretty cool, and here's how it works. We basically have those uh, spacecraft simulators or test beds which hover on a really smooth uh, floor. So you can see here the black floor uh, is actually very smooth, up to a few micrometers. And then there's uh, air coming out of here so that you can hover over the floor. And you have actual thrusters up here to uh, get sideways motion. And we can in total do six degrees of freedom, so the upper portion of our virtual spacecraft uh, can also rotate. And that's how it looks like in reality. Uh, so here we have uh, four of those kind of spacecrafts just moving together in the space. And there are, of, of course, a lot of interesting research problems here in the area of uh, control uh, and uh, formation and so on. Um, ALCL is also part of CAST. And so one of the big moonshot problems that you might have heard about is the flying ambulance. And so the flying ambulance idea is to use a hybrid aircraft that can help in search and rescue scenarios to get people uh, out uh, and to a hospital. And so here we have already a prototype. It's, of course, not as big as it will be uh, in the future. Uh, but that's another experimental space that we have with a wind tunnel. So we can generate very strong events inside and make interesting experiments on the aerodynamic effects that will happen uh, with the fixed wing structure. And the research here is all about uh, also control right now and design how can we most efficiently figure out a good configuration of such an aircraft. And then uh, fairly new is uh, what is known as Leonardo which stands for legs on board a drone. And so I will just show uh, the video. It's just a few weeks old. Um, it's pretty cool. So here we have basically a combination of a leg robot and a quad rotor. So you can see four rotors up here. And the idea is that by using such a combination, we can maybe work more on rough terrain, which is traditionally difficult for bipedal robots and stabilize it better while not using as much energy as just a flying robot would use because we still have those uh, legs. All right, so in general, uh, our research direction is in control of nonlinear systems. Uh, we work a little bit in state estimation, so for spacecraft fusion of GNSS and vision. Uh, and we also do a bunch of motion planning uh, for multi-robot vehicles. And actually, all of those areas use some sort of AI. Not all of them use specifically machine learning, but some of them use uh, more traditional AI techniques. All right, 
So with that, I want to present one concrete research project that we actually just submitted to one of the top robotics conferences uh, called ICRA. Uh, and that is work together with uh, graduate student Guan Ye Shi, um, Yi Song, uh, and Sun Zhou. All right. So we are interested in close proximity flight of aircraft. And you can think about it as having many interesting applications, for example, for inspection, uh, deployment of drones from like a common truck, uh, or fast exploration. In all of those cases, you might have drones that have to fly really close to each other in order to achieve a task or to achieve the task quickly. Now, when you do like lab experiments uh, and you just let two drones hover, uh, there's this effect, which is known as the downwash effect. And you could see, uh, let me play it again. You could see that the upper drone can perfectly go on its target trajectory, but the lower drone has this weird bump here. Um, and so traditionally, what we do uh, for motion planning is we have this really conservative safety regions to avoid this effect. But it would be obviously better if we could attack the problem directly during flight. And so we did a little bench test with the tiny quad rotors that you see here. Uh, each of them just weighs 34 grams. And if you let two of them hover on top of each other with like half a meter of spacing, uh, which is quite large compared to the size that's so just about 10 centimeters uh, wide, uh, then the lower one has already eight grams of thrust loss. And the drones in total can only do about 50 grams. So we're already getting really, really close to the physical limits of such a drone. And so the research questions here are, um, what happens if we actually have more than two, which nobody really has studied so far, and can we accurately model it and compensate for it to get much better flight results? All right, so we have to do uh, a little bit of math here. So typically, uh, when we look at dynamics of quad rotors, we just model it as a rigid body dynamics. Uh, so in the first row, uh, we have the position dynamics. Uh, so P is the position, V is our velocity. And then that's just uh, Newton equation, which uh, relates uh, the force to, to gravity. Uh, and then we have R, which is our current rotation matrix. And Fu is the force that the rotors create in our body frame. So we rotate it back to the world frame by multiplying with our rotation matrix. And then the second row, we have our attitude dynamics, which just relates the change of our rotation to our angular velocity, which we can measure in practice. And then J is our inertia matrix. And we have, again, uh, the torque, which is something which we can control more or less directly by changing the speeds of our four rotors. Um, so you can think of Fu and uh, tau u as kind of the control inputs, because they're linearly related uh, to the motor speeds, which we actually control. Now, what we do here is uh, we think of the aerodynamic effects that we don't really know about as residual dynamics, which Yi Song mentioned earlier today already. And those are not modeled, but we can see them as a function that we don't know. And that function could be a function of a lot of different things, which we also not quite know. It could be the state, it could be the environment, it could be the action. And our task is to figure out what it is um, and uh, to model it accurately. Now, what we were interested in is actually a drone swarms. And a swarm is typically more than two vehicles, like ideally 10 or more. And here we have the additional challenge that there are many different configurations of swarms that in the state space look different, but are actually identical. So one example is here, where we have three quad rotors. And we can just uh, swap, for example, those two. Uh, it looks different in the state space, if we would just stack the states of all the robots. However, um, uh, it's just a permutation, so the resulting effect should be similar. So we really need a machine learning solution here that is permutation invariant, and that also ideally works with a, a, a priori unknown number of neighbors. So it could be two neighboring drones or five neighboring drones, and the estimation should still work. 
And so we build our work on what is known as uh, deep sets, which is just about two years old. And what they do in deep sets is that they basically uh, figure out a functional structure uh, that is useful for learning for permutation invariant functions. And the canonical example is actually the MNIST data set where you have handwritten digits and then the input uh, would be a sequence of those pictures and the output would be sum of the digits. And you intuitively can think of, yeah, that makes sense because each digit somehow encodes a number and if we figure out what the number is then we can just add them up and uh, get the sum. And so we do a similar thing here where the residual force FA uh, is a function of our neighboring states. And then the function has a bunch of components. The first component is uh, phi here, which basically maps the relative state we have to some higher dimensional state. We use arbitrarily dimension of 40. And we hope that in this higher dimensional state, actually the summation is a superposition of the hidden state. So instead of the picture example where the picture somehow encodes a number and the number is very low dimensional and then we can add it, we try to find a higher dimensional state here uh, where superposition is valid. And that's actually just a function that we learn with a deep neural network uh, that is parameterized by some weights. So then the superposition is just uh, the sum over here where we essentially just put in the relative state uh, of ourselves to the neighbors. Uh, and then we have another outer function rho that uh, at the end uh, takes the summation as input and estimates the final residual force that we're interested in. And that's another deep neural network. Now for training, we uh, use just supervised learning, which means we somehow need a labeled data set. And the way we create the, the labeled data set here is by flying really random example trajectories. And by random, I mean we actually randomly generate goal points uh, for each of the quadrotors that we have, and then we use a collision avoidance method that's very simple to make sure that they don't collide. And uh, we collect uh, a bunch of data, which is the positions, the velocities, uh, the acceleration uh, from our onboard sensors, the current orientation of the drone, and also the motor forces. Um, and then if you remember, uh, we take back the dynamics, we had those position dynamics. Uh, now we know the acceleration, uh, we know gravity of course, we know the mass, we know our orientation, which means we can actually just compute FA now. And that FA becomes our label for our labeled data set. Uh, so we compute that and then our data set is really just as a set of relative states now, which uh, was X in Yi Song's talk and our label Y uh, would be for us uh, the residual force FA. And here's just a short video how the data collection looks like. There's two drones, you can kind of see uh, they randomly fly around and then there's this like artificial potential which always pushes them away from each other if they end up uh, flying too close uh, to each other. Now, how can we apply the uh, residual dynamics uh, to our controller? Uh, that's fairly straightforward because we just have to put it into our position controller as an additional feedforward term. Now, unfortunately, to really test if uh, the flight performance as well for large teams, all the control should be run on board of the drone. Now the drones we are using are very small, as I mentioned earlier, and they only have a very small microcontroller on board. Uh, just to give you an idea, it has uh, about 192 kilobytes of RAM. It runs at less than 200 megahertz. Uh, it has a small floating point unit on board, but you can certainly not do uh, really crazy stuff on it. And so we take uh, basically the models that we learned for FA, uh, which we trained using just PyTorch and automatically generate Z code so we can then compile for that particular network architecture. Um, and so we get one uh, network for each of the functions, uh, row and fee, and it turns out that if we uh, implement it well, uh, we can actually evaluate uh, that total function with up to 
uh, I think about 10 neighbors in a few milliseconds, which is plenty because we only need to run the position controller at around 100 hertz. And here's the final result uh, if we do it for that just two agent case. And you can see there's still like a little bit of a bump, uh, but it's much better than before. So in particular, if as performance metric, we just uh, look at the absolute error in uh, C height, then we have a reduction in this example from nine centimeters to two centimeters, uh, which is significant. And so of course, we're talking about robot swarms. Uh, so we have to do a little bit more. So here we collected more data with three drones and with four drones. Um, and then we did a baseline, and that's five drones. And if you look, let me play it again. So one at the bottom, uh, it even goes out of the picture. That's how large the downwash here is. And then if we run with our neural network, um, then you see uh, it's much better. It's still not perfect. And the reason why it's not perfect in this case is actually uh, because we already lim uh, reached the limit uh, of our motors. The one at the bottom uh, gets so much downwash that we cannot fully compensate for it anymore with our current motors. And another interesting thing is that's a swarm of five quad rotors, uh, but we only trained the network uh, with four quad rotors. And so we tried to figure out when uh, does the network actually uh, kind of pick up uh, the important part of the superposition uh, of the hidden layer. And so it turns out um, uh, if you just train with two crazy flies, then you get a pretty good improvement in the maximum uh, height error uh, for the two crazy fly case, but then uh, two robot case. But then if you test that same network with three, four, or five drones, then it's even worse than the baseline. So clearly here the deep set uh, didn't learn anything useful in the hidden state. But already if you have just three of them, uh, you basically uh, get improvements all the way. And uh, the more you train with, you basically just have more data at the end and that helps you to achieve uh, better performance, of course. And so uh, it surprisingly uh, generalizes really well uh, here in our case. Um, we also looked at uh, the predictions in a different quantitative way. So here um, we have an example where we just trained with uh, three multi rotors, but we have four drones. And it's a similar example again where they all meet in the middle at one point uh, over here. And that's when uh, kind of the, the hardest part happens and then they move back. So there are two points of contact where all robots are basically in one vertical line. And you can see the top one uh, is pretty boring. Nothing really happens. Uh, now our prediction uh, is fine. Uh, so the second one has some very interesting effect over here, uh, where after there's some downwash, there's suddenly what we call an upwash. And the third one has an even larger upwash over here. And to our knowledge, that's actually an effect that is not really known in the literature yet, uh, that you can have those kind of very short upwashes uh, that actually only happens uh, with a, uh, if you have a, a velocity as well. And you can also see for the last one, uh, it's not a trivial kind of, uh, kind of change of our force FA, but we are still able to uh, learn it pretty well. And so what you can do once you have learned this, you can also visualize it to kind of let a human interpret how the results look like and if it physically makes sense or not. And so let me guide you uh, through that graph. So let's first look uh, at the top left one. Uh, so here we have one uh, robot uh, in the middle already. And we can place the second one uh, somewhere relative to the first one. Uh, so for example, if I place it here, so the second one is above uh, the blue star. And the color now encodes how big the downwash is. So all the area up here, the downwash is basically zero, according to our color scale. But if you're flying directly below, uh, then there's a pretty high downwash. And the lower we go, uh, the downwash uh, also reduces, which physically makes sense. Now, if you look in this picture, 
uh, we certainly have uh, a robot that actually moves uh, sideways with a certain velocity. And then we get uh, this wide area here, which is actually the upwash. Uh, so it only happens according to our model if we really have relative velocities uh, between the agents. So in the second column, you can kind of see that the superposition is not really just a superposition in uh, the FA of single quad rotors, but it's more complex uh, because the magnitude uh, doesn't go quite as high uh, as it would go if you would just superposition the data of uh, two robots each. Now that's all nice, but all we have done so far is basically some supervised learning and then we tried it and it worked, but we did some crucial mistake here because we certainly have in our controller a neural network and that destroys all the theoretical guarantees that our prior controller might have because we have this unknown here. So the big challenge for us was how can we still make sure that our guarantees uh, stay the same? And in particular, there are two things we need to consider. One, uh, we trained our neural network on some data, but there's other data that we probably have not seen. And Yi Song already talked a little bit about this. There's uh, some studies, both empirical and theoretical, that basically relates the amount of uh, training data uh, that you need and the errors that you can expect in the prediction. Uh, the second problem uh, we have is that it could happen that our neural network somehow creates weird oscillations. And typically when you uh, do stability proofs, you assume that you have bounded uh, desired state changes. So if you get oscillations in your dynamics model, then your stability proof would also fall apart. And so here we use a technique uh, which is called uh, spectral normalization, which basically helps us to bound how much our residual dynamics uh, can change already during training. And under, those, under some mild assumptions, we can basically, using those uh, techniques, show uh, that the controller is still exponentially uh, stable. And just to give you an idea how it looks like without going into the detail, uh, the actual um, convergence depends on our control gains, on the Lipschitz constant, which is uh, related to the spectral normalization, and then, of course, the approximation error of our neural network, which we can predict based on how much data uh, we used for training. All right. So in conclusion uh, for this talk, uh, we used machine learning uh, to basically learn the residual dynamics and applied it to a nonlinear controller. Um, with some careful tricks or techniques, we managed to uh, retain the theoretical guarantees uh, that we had before from control theory. And another side effect for this particular one is uh, that because we use this deep set architecture, our model is actually decentralized, and we have shown that it's computationally efficient because we can run it on those very small uh, microcontrollers. Now, I hope I excited you for the field of robotics. And if you're an undergrad and you're still looking uh, for a place to be, um, our lab with papers uh, is at aerospacerobotics.caltech.edu. And the director of the lab is Professor Sun Cho Cha. Thank you very much. Uh, that's 16, so there's uh, three rings, there's one ring in the middle, and then they're interleaving outer rings. And, and what, would happen if you, what, what would happen if you did model the residual dynamics? This video was actually uh, done without residual dynamics modeling, but we uh, just, it's based on some new work we did on accounting for motor delays directly into the controller design. It's a new baseline, and we're still planning to try it with residual dynamics. So here, it's hard to see in the video, but it doesn't do perfect tracking. And once we apply our neural network, we hope to get nearly perfect tracking. So does that mean we can get it much tighter together? Yes. That's, I think, the tightest we have seen for those kind of quad rotors. How much did it look like the 
Uh, what was the question? Why do you need 16 pipelines? What's the application? Right. Right. So, yeah. So the question was, what's the application for tight flying drones? Um, so, I would say for search and rescue. For example, you want to send a bunch of drones to explore uh, after a collapse of a cave or something. Uh, so, and you want to fly really close together to quickly get all the drones in. Uh, other examples would be inspection tasks, uh, where you might want to figure out very quickly where damage on a structure occurred, and then you also need uh, a lot of vehicles at the same time. Yes. Oh, of course, yes. I mean, uh, a lot of those uh, kind of drones have been commercialized by Intel and uh, Veritas Studios in Switzerland. Uh, they do drone shows uh, indoors and outdoors. Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. It's an excellent question. I actually don't know the answer to it. Um, I think so far the research is uh, not directly considering the ambulance aspect because we have this kind of smaller model where we cannot really put a human in. Uh, but the research questions we look at is uh, how to have the control transition nicely. Because so far people have uh, fixed wing controllers and they have quad rotor controllers. But then uh, when you need to transition between the modes, uh, you basically uh, have this discontinuity. So the big question we are looking at, how can you make this smoothly and safely?